So this is lecture 8 of ECE 2305. So in today's lecture um, is part 2 of the two-part lecture. So we saw in lecture 7 uh, the start of modulation and enco enco encoding um, with respect to having data and uh, superimposing it onto some sort of signal. Right? So we have a message, say it's M of T, and then we somehow uh, convert it, map it, uh, manipulate it, superimpose it onto a signal, S of T, that we then send across a transmission medium, and the receiver is responsible for guessing, extracting, retrieving that message signal, reconstructing it, M of T, from the intercepted S of T, which is corrupted with noise and other baddies. So in today's lecture, what we're going to be looking at so, okay, so backtrack. Last lecture, we looked at digital data, digital signals. What we're going to be looking at in this lecture are analog data, digital signals, digital data, analog signals, and analog data, analog signals, okay? Uh, the last one, analog data, analog signals, we'll only touch upon because we already did discuss this in several other lectures such as AM and FM and PM and, and those types of schemes. What we're going to really focus on are digital data and analog signals because that's used a lot in unguided media like wireless communications. And we're going to look at analog data and digital signals. And that's more like in things like pulse coded modulation and the like. So we're going to look at that a little bit more. Okay. So th that's what we're going to be covering today in today's lecture. So digital data analog signals. So what this involves is the conversion of bit information, right? Ones and zeros. We map it to unique amplitude, phase, and frequency values of a waveform across a time period T. These waveforms, okay, can assume a variety of different features and, and, be, and we can manipulate different, um, d these different characteristics in unique manner. So sometimes what we might do is just manipulate the amplitude and leave the frequency and the phase alone. Sometimes we can manipulate the frequency and leave the amplitude and the phase alone. Sometimes we can manipulate the phase and leave the frequency and amplitude alone. Or we can manipulate combinations of those features. And what all of this tries to do is we're trying to take an analog waveform, an analog signal, manipulate its characteristics across every t seconds and then send it across the medium and then the receiver is supposed to say aha you're this amplitude you must be this bit pattern so the um, process of converting those bits into these features of these analog waveforms every t seconds is understood it's recognized it's known at the transmitter and receiver so the mapping if you will between the bits and those features in the waveform are known at both transmitter and receiver. That way you can decode, you can guess correctly, or make your best guess as to what has been received because you too know what the transmitter, how it's doing this mapping process. So several modulation techniques that exist out there are things called amplitude shift keying, and that's manipulating um, the signal waveform based on just amplitude information alone. There's frequency shift keying, or FSK. It's doing the same thing, but you manipulate the frequency every T seconds. There's phase shift keying, where you manipulate the phase information. And then finally, and this is the interesting one, this is combining both amplitude and phase information, okay, manipulating those two in order to convey bit information in each combination of an amplitude value, unique amplitude value, and phase value, and we call it QAM, or quadrature amplitude modulation. So the first guy we're going to look at is amplitude, amplitude shift keying, or ASK. It also goes by the name of OOK, on-off keying. Okay? And so what happens in this case is that the values, these amplitude values, are represented by, oh, sorry, <clears throat> these binary patterns, like let's say one or more bits can be represented by different amplitudes of a carrier frequency and that often we have one amplitude value that is zero. 
So when we usually use ASK, right, ASK, in things like optical fiber. So how does it look? So this is what ASK or ASK looks like. Usually it's called ASK. Don't, don't go to a digital comms person and say, can you tell me about the ASK modulation? No one's going to know what you're talking about. ASK, folks. <laughs> so what happens is, let's, let's say we take something called binary ASK which means that we're using ASK modulation to represent one or zero, which means we only have one of two possible amplitude values. So let's say the mapping, the modulation rule, is the following. So one is represented by an amplitude value of one. And a zero is represented by an amplitude value of zero. And remember that it's on a carrier. It's on a sinusoid waveform, right? So let's say we have one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one. So every t seconds. So when we have a one, we have this. We have a sign. Then zero means we have nothing. It's a zero amplitude. What happens when you have a zero amplitude of a sign? Zero. One. Zero. One. One. Zero. One. Okay. So this is what ask looks like. Sorry. Because I'm asking for it. <laughs> what happens is you have this voltage level, so you have the 1, right, the amplitude. And when it's 0, 0 voltage, right? It's off. So that is ASK modulation, or binary ASK. And you can also have other types of ASK, 4 ASK, 8 ASK, in which case you have 4 or 8 amplitude values, uh, and each one represents a unique pattern of binary digits or bits. The next guy is called frequency shift keying, or FSK. Yeah, don't, don't pronounce it FSK. You know, that, that also doesn't make sense. Um, and what FSK does is it, again, th very similar to ASK, but in ch instead of changing the amplitude, you instead change the frequency of the sine carrier per t seconds. So, and, and what one thing that's really cool about FSK so ASK is very susceptible to anything that involves messing up its amplitude. Let's say you send it through a transmission medium and there's amplitude distortion. It, it messes things up. If you use FSK, it doesn't care what the amplitude is. The information is contained in the frequency every t seconds. Oh, so let's look at an example of FSK. So FSK looks like this. Across time. And so suppose we use, we look at binary FSK. So we have one of two possible frequencies. So a one, so this is our mapping, is represented by frequency F1, and zero is represented by frequency F2. So every t seconds, what we get is, let's say this is the frequency of the sign. And when we hit 0, well, that's cool. But you get a much higher frequency, right? Oh, 1, 0, 1. And still one. So what you notice is that every t seconds, the frequency of the sine wave changes, right? So you have this, this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, the oh, uh, ee, sorry, this guy. All of those are sine waves. 
of frequency f1. And this, this, now this, is frequency f2, which in this case, f2 is greater than f1, and we can see that. And your receiver is going to see that, and it will say, ah, you must be 0 or 1, based on what the frequency it picks up. PSK, or phase shift keying, very popular. What it does, same concept as ASK and, P and FSK, but, oh, this, this one I love. What happens is it does phase shifts. So frequency stays the same, amplitude phase the same, but the, uh, but the phase changes based on whether, uh, w what sort of information is being conveyed. Okay? There's also something called differential PSK. And, um, and what differential PSK, just like what we saw in lecture 7 with um, uh, things like the differential Manchester coding, right, um, is that uh, it's not so, so much the absolute information at that given time instant, but rather um, what, what the previous and the successive sequences, what their information is, will dictate what sort of phase is chosen in that case, right? So how does PSK look like? And we're going to look at a specific and extremely popular form of PSK called binary PSK or BPSK. So at BPSK, the way it looks like is the, the following. So BPSK or binary phase shift keying. Okay, or BPSK. What happens is suppose what would be the best way of drawing it? So let's say if a 1 means that my sign has a phase that's equal to 0 degrees. Now what happens if, let's say I let 0 have a phase that's equal to 180? So what happens when a signal waveform, like a sine wave, has 180 degrees phase? It inverts, right? The amplitude inverts. So let's, let's put this to action, okay? So let's say here's time. So I have to be really, I have to have a steady hand here because this is going to be important. So let's say I have 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay? So let's say I have this guy. So that's a sine wave. Okay? Here it is again. Whoop! Now 180 degree phase shift. Notice that now it's out of phase. Whoop. Back in phase. Whoop. Out of phase. And continues to be out of phase by 180 degrees. So what you'll see is the receiver is going to detect these discontinuities in the phase, oops, there's no discontinuity there, sorry. But you, it'll see these discontinuities in the signal and say, oh, there was a phase shift. And be able to determine, um, um, like, you know, if a transition has happened between ones and zeros. And then it will look and it'll say, okay, as a reference, okay, that's, that guy's in phase. Oh, and this guy's 180 degrees out of phase, in phase, out of phase, out of phase. And so that's how BPSK works. The receiver is going to look at what is the relative phase of the incoming period of that signal and say whether that sine wave is in phase or out of phase by 180 degrees. And we're not restricted to 180 degrees. You can do 90 degrees, 270 degrees, whatever you want. But 180 is really nice because the transition and the absolute phase is, is really obvious as opposed to 90 degrees out of phase. The, tra the, it, the transition might not be as readily observable. Alrighty. So QAM or QAM. So it's a combination of ASK and PSK, and it's a it's it's a little bit tricky to explain in using time domain signals. But what it does is you're manipulating the amplitude information, and at the same time you're manipulating the phase information. So you're you're doing two things at the same time per t seconds. 
And so as a result, what you're doing is you're giving your transmission more degrees of freedom. Now you're giving two ways of representing more information. So let's say you, you want to, like, like, let's say with ASK, you want to represent one of eight possible um, uh, amplitude values, right? So that's going to be three bits. And then maybe PSK, you want to do BPSK, right? So uh, you need a, 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 a bit to represent one phase or another. Now imagine if you can combine the two together, you can conceivably transmit four bits every t seconds based on what phase and what amplitude value is being employed. That's really powerful stuff. So you can load up even more information every t seconds. Okay? So that's really powerful stuff. And those two characteristics are actually independent of each other. So what you put on the amplitude does not, you know, does not influence what you put onto the phase, right? So I'll do my best to draw this. <laughs> so let's say we take our BPSK and we take our, um, let's say we take BPSK and BASK. So we'll, we're going to combine BASK and BPSK into one. So now, let's say every t seconds, so each one of these guys, every t seconds, uh, we, tr we can transmit one bit. Now what I'm going to do is, let's say I have 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. I guess I like 1, 1s. So the first bit, I'm going to let be equal to the amplitude. And the second bit is going to signify the phase. Okay? So let's say a 1, so, yeah, I wish I can think. A 1 means an amplitude of a 1, and a 0 is an amplitude of a minus 1, in this case. And then suppose, and that's for amplitudes. And then let's say a 1 represents a phase of 0, and a, one, a 0 represents a phase of 180 degrees. Okay? So 1, 1 means we have an amplitude of 1 and a phase difference of 0. So actually, let's make that a 0. Okay? Now we have 1, 0. So what does that mean? So the amplitude is 1, so it's still 1, but it's out of, out of phase by 180 degrees. And now we have 0, 0, which means 0 amplitude. And actually, that won't work, because if it's 0 amplitude, we don't know what phase that is. So not good. Hmm. It's difficult coming up with amplitude values on the fly. How about we make this 2? Okay. So what that's going to mean is I'm going to have something that's twice the amplitude value, and it's going to be out of phase by 180 degrees. So, yep, you guessed it. Twice the amplitude value. And then... 1, 1, we go back to 0 degrees phase, an amplitude of 1. Now we have something that is 2 amplitude and 0 degrees out of phase. And then finally, 1, 1, two, amplitude of 1 and 0 degrees out of phase. So that, folks, tells me two bits of information rather than one every t seconds. Okay. Okay, so there's a typo, so this should not be called 
quadrature amplitude modulation, that's something else. Um, what this, now we're going to talk about having analog data like my speech or image information that you get with a camera and how you digitize it into a digital signal. And this could be used um, in, in a variety of applications uh, such as your cell phone, for instance, when you take your human speech and then you convert into digital data and, and then transmit it on the phone or maybe over a um, telephone line or something. Um, so the digitization, as I mentioned before, can be achieved using an analog to digital converter. And if you want to get the analog in, uh, signal back, use a digital to analog converter. And um, then you can take that, that, that analog digitized information and then use um, NRLZ, uh, sorry, NRZL, or, NRZ, um, or, or you can use a code other than that. You can convert it back into an analog signal. So there are a variety of uh, outcomes that you can have when you do the digitization process. So we talked about NRZL in lecture seven, right? And so the A to D converter is really important because that's what performs the digitization process. So it will sample an analog waveform and then it will convert its amplitude into one of uh, a finite possible number of amplitude values, so that's called quantization, and then those finite number of amplitude values have an associated binary pattern, and that's usually achieved through something called a code book. Okay, so there's a unique binary pattern for each amplitude value. And so there are two principal codec techniques. So there's something called delta modulation and pulse coded modulation. Okay, so pulse coded modulation is based on sampling theory, which what happens is we need to have an analog digital converter that's really, 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 really um, solid in terms of being able to sample without doing any aliasing. So if you sample too slowly, it might not be possible to recreate your analog waveform at the receiver. Okay? So you have to sample at a sufficiently high enough rate okay, in order to have enough information to reconstruct the analog signal at the other end. And so the samples of the, uh, uh, are analog samples, and we call them pulse amplitude modulation samples. And then to convert it to digital, um, we, we sample it, and then we quantize it, and then we send the digital information across, like, you know, using one of those uh, techniques I described, the NRZL, uh, or binary information, or convert it back into an analog waveform. So what I'm going to do, oops, is I'm going to draw the process of PCM, uh, roughly, of course. So what happens is you have your analog in, okay, analog uh, data. Okay. So the first thing that happens is that it's sampled. Okay. So you have, let's say, some signal over T. What the sampled signal will look like is like a stem plot, like this. But Notice again, so this is what's meant by discrete time. So I have these at discrete instances, 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, so on and so forth. But the amplitude values, um, the amplitudes can assume one of a continuum possible uh, number of amplitude values. So, so what happens is um, I can have an infinite number of choices for the amplitude values. This is not good. Because if I want to assign a unique binary pattern, I cannot have an infinite number of choices. I cannot assign an infinite number of bits to represent one of an infinite number of amplitude values. I've got to do something called quantization. So quantization, what it does is it rounds those amplitude values to a finite number of possible amplitude values. So so what ends up happening is they get rounded okay rounded to a finite number of amplitude values okay and why do we do that because now if we have a1 a2, A3, A4, all the way to An, I can then map that 
to a binary pattern, right? All the way to, okay? And we call this mapping. Once we've quantized it, we call this a code book, right? So this tells us how the mapping between the quantized amplitude values and these binary ones and zero patterns are. Okay? So once we quantize it, then we can um, you know, use um, you know, like modulation and then send it across a transmission medium, right? So that's the transmission medium. And it could be anything. It could be fiber. Um, could be twisted copper pair, could be any one of those guys. And then the receiver, right, what the receiver will do is it's going to demodulate, right, demod, okay. And what it's going to do is it's going to try and recreate, recreate the analog data. What it's going to do, first of all, is demod, it's going to decode, Right? Using that code book back into these samples. And then it's going to do digital to analog conversion to get your analog data out. That's in and that's out. So in a nutshell, that's how pulse coded modulation works. And, and again, I mentioned that the modulation here can be one of um, a variety of uh, techniques and such. But, but yeah, so your information, your analog information gets sampled, gets quantized, the amplitude values. Your amplitude values get uh, assigned to a, 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 you know, get converted into a um, code word. So these guys here are called code words. Okay? And then modulation takes place, it's sent across the transmission, the transmission medium, and then the reverse happens at the receiver. Okay, last but not least, we did talk about this before, and you will be exploring this more in your hands-on experiment number one, is modulation of like, uh, with analog data and analog signals. And um, those include things like amplitude modulation, angle modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation, where we have, let's say, my human speech. And let's say the fluctuation, like the strength of it is communicated over the air using... Um, uh, like let's say the amplitude of my speech is communicated on a sine carrier and its amplitude varies based on how strong or how weak my signal is. And that's an example. You can do the same thing with frequency information based on let's say signal strength or phase information. So as, as a couple of examples, you can have the following. So like something as simple as like here's an analog signal and um, and analog data. So what I can do is let's say I talk loud and then it's weak and then it's loud again. So what I can do is something like well let's say we don't use speech but like some sort of signal and what happens is the envelope right um, is, is ac the actual analog signal, uh, the information, and then it's superimposed on this sign carrier. So that, that's one way of using amplitude to communicate a very simple um, a signal. Another way is also, let's say, uh, louder signals have a higher frequency and weaker signals have a, lo a, a lower frequency. So let's say looking at this, you could have something that let's say very high frequency and then it, oh sorry, very wide and then very, and so this would represent a high amplitude and this because of the lower frequency would re represent a lower amplitude. So, so these are very simple techniques like actual AM radio and FM radio transceivers are much more complicated than this but the principle would be you always stay in the analog domain, you don't digitize anything, 
and you communicate that information using that analog, analog uh, signal. Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes lecture, lecture eight.